subscribing and leaving comments. the 1950s, hikers and woodsmen roaming the wilderness of Northern California came back with reports of a strange ape-like creature. Then in 1958, as loggers plunged ever deeper into the ancient forests of the Cascade Range, they found huge footprints unlike any seen before. The press immediately dubbed it Bigfoot. Now the quest picks up the trail. Hey, you fellas got to come up here and take a look at this. Is Bigfoot the last great undiscovered animal in the world? Or just a big hoax? Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest have long believed in a creature they call Sasquatch. An ape-like being dwelling on the fringes of civilization. That was only folklore or so people thought. Then, as legend turned to rumor, two hunters who'd never seen Bigfoot set out to shoot it on film. They set out for Bluff Creek in Trinity National Forest. 160 miles north of San Francisco, it had a reputation as one of Bigfoot's stomping grounds. Roger Patterson was a former rodeo rider and part-time inventor. Bob Gimlin, an expert horseman and tracker. According to Patterson's account, for seven days, they saw nothing. All that changed on October 20th, 1967. When it happened, the horses were the first to know. Patterson was so stunned, he fell from his mount. As he stumbled forward with his camera, he claimed the creature paused to look back at them. Gimlin trained his gun in case it attacked. The creature had seen enough. It took off into the forest. Patterson followed its flight with his camera, but he'd already taken too many shots of the scenery. Abruptly, he ran out of film. This is the actual film shot by Roger Patterson. Most scientists dismiss it as a clever hoax. Patterson earned a tidy profit as he licensed the footage worldwide. His friend, Bob Gimlin, who didn't make a nickel, maintains the film is genuine. What they saw, he says, wasn't a human dressed in fur a flesh-and-blood creature. Separating fact from fantasy isn't easy. Since Bigfoot first appeared in the California press, the story has multiplied in the tabloids, where every year brings another tall tale. As if this weren't enough to muddy its reputation, Many of its alleged footprints and hair samples turned out to be fake. One bit of fur, found alongside a footprint in California, 
was actually the hair from a Barbie doll. Left, right, left. Do the fakes prove Bigfoot is a fraud? Or did the Patterson film actually capture a shy cousin of man hiding out in the wilderness for thousands, perhaps millions of years? As the world's population grows, how could an animal as large as Bigfoot evade capture? Many zoologists believe all the Earth's large animals have already been discovered. Yet scientists spotted the first mountain gorilla in Africa only in 1901. The first giant panda was captured in China in 1936. Both were once dismissed as mere folklore. In 1939, zoologists in South Africa were stunned to discover the coelacanth, a fish they thought had been extinct for 50,000 years. I did a calculation and I came up with about 40% of all known mammal species, 40% were discovered in this century. Um, Richard Greenwell is a member of the International Society of Cryptozoology, which searches for unknown animals. For mainstream scientists, cryptozoology is a pseudoscience, infatuated with giant octopuses and living dinosaurs. But Greenwell thinks Bigfoot is alive and well hidden. There are vast regions on this planet where, where there is hardly anybody at all or hardly anybody goes. And certainly uh, intelligent animals like primates could survive there and, and remain undetected. It is possible. Greenwell believes the animal may also be nocturnal, further explaining why it hasn't been discovered. Animals have strategies for survival, you know, some move in herds, others have spines on their backs. Perhaps some animals have a strategy that makes them more difficult to, to find. I call that elusiveness. Entranced by such a large quarry and undaunted by the skimpy evidence, a small group of researchers mounted the most exhaustive hunt yet to find the elusive creature. Saturday. The most abundant evidence of Bigfoot, according to believers, are its footprints. There's one right here. That's definitely hers. So far, collectors have cast more than 400 of them. Bob Titmus, who's explored the backwoods of British Columbia, saw his first Bigfoot track on a logging road in 1958. I'd never seen anything like it. I couldn't imagine what on earth was making it. And after I tracked it several times in the next few weeks, I, I came to believe that it had to be, absolutely had to be some live animal. Titmus has been a professional hunter all his life, from Alaska to Mexico. But the trophies on his wall belong to Bigfoot. He believes no man or machine could have made these tracks. The fluctuation in the track, in the, the movement in the foot, and the places this would go that no mechanical thing could have gone. The tracks would eventually lead Titmus to a remote canyon in the Rockies of northern British Columbia on a summer day in 1963. Thirty years later, the memory of what he claims he saw there remains as vivid as when it happened. I was going up a, an old glacier bed, and there was reports of Indians having shot one up there many years before. And looking across the canyon, a huge canyon in front of me, I noticed three things going up the opposite wall. It was three Sasquatch and they were climbing just hand over hand like this. And then they bring up a foot and feel around for a toe hold and that sort of thing. And I watched them a little over 20 minutes before they got over the top. That was a sight to see. Like other Sasquatch hunters who came back empty handed, Titmus has met with only ridicule. Without even a snapshot, no one believed him. 
except John Green. A journalist and former newspaper publisher in British Columbia, he had followed Bigfoot in the press. When he heard about Titmus's find, he tracked him down. Well, in 1958, there was a picture in the newspaper of a man holding a cast, one of these huge footprints. I just got in the car and went down there to see what it was all about. And footprints are real. There has to be something real to make them. Since 1958, Green has collected more than 3,000 eyewitness accounts from the United States and Canada. In some cases, even obtaining sworn affidavits. Most sightings are in the Pacific Northwest. Others come from as far east as Indiana and Arkansas. Green admits some reports turned out to be false but he's convinced most are authentic. It reaches the point where the explanation that there is an animal with a foot like that and it looks like what people say they see is by far the simpler explanation than to try to patch together some human conspiracy operating over hundreds of years and right across the entire globe. From 1958 to 1962, both Titmus and Green became involved in expeditions led by fellow enthusiast Tom Slick. An oil millionaire, Slick spent a small fortune to try and track Bigfoot down, even managing to collect his alleged droppings. When he died in a plane crash, the trail grew cold. Slick's records of his expeditions and his evidence vanished. Some say his company destroyed them out of embarrassment. Others say they're hidden away. Perhaps the most methodical search for Bigfoot is taking place here at Washington State University. Anthropologist Grover Krantz has risked his professional reputation by taking Bigfoot seriously, largely because he believes the footprints are real. What happened here is the individual stepped on a stone and the stone impressed deeply into the foot. Now we know that this was not a fake that somebody put on and rocked it side to side to get the impression on both sides because a very good fingerprint expert was able to trace dermal ridges running all the way across the footprint without any break uh, right through the um, uh, rock impression. And since there's no human foot that this is this large and no human foot has that thickness of padding, we're quite sure this is real. By studying the Patterson film frame by frame, Krantz has even come up with how he thinks Bigfoot walks. They do swing their arms back and forth in a human manner, but the differences come from they lean forward at the hip uh, more than a normal human does or should. When they put weight support on one foot, they bend the knee, so. Whether by coincidence or design, most reports of Bigfoot have described the same slumping posture, slightly bent knees, and free swaying arms. Solid proof, like Bigfoot, remains elusive. Yet the camera-shy creature gets around. It's even been spotted on the other side of the world. The Himalayas have long been the home of the legendary Yeti. Like Bigfoot, a hairy, ape-like creature with a cone-shaped head. In 1921, British mountaineers ventured into its domain when they set out to scale Mount Everest. At 17,000 feet, two-thirds of the way up, a Sherpa guide spotted dark figures moving in a snowfield above them. According to the guide, the creature was the elusive Matoa Kangmi, the man who is not a man. A mistake in translation would give it its popular name, the Abominable Snowman. By the time the group reached the spot, the figures, true to form, were gone. Overnight, 
the reclusive, abominable snowman became a worldwide sensation. In fact, he was a man-like creature, according to the Sherpas, who lived high up in the mountains, occasionally coming down to pilfer food from the villagers or devour a yak. And he wasn't abominable, but a shy, harmless beast who shunned humans. For the next 40 years, dozens of other sightings were reported. Then in 1960, the conqueror of Everest, Sir Edmund Hillary, returned to the Himalayas on a scientific expedition. One of his goals, to find the Yeti. What he found were snowy footprints allegedly made by the creature. He concluded that they were ordinary animal tracks, perhaps those of a bear, enlarged and distorted as the snow melted. Hillary also examined the so-called Yeti skull cap, preserved in a Tibetan monastery. Instead, it was the skin of a goat-like animal called a sarau. The abominable snowman, it turned out, was also invisible. The Sherpas believed he could disappear at will. The Yeti, Hillary concluded, was merely a fascinating fairy tale. The idea of an ape-like creature living on the fringes of humanity has been around for thousands of years, from the epic of Gilgamesh in ancient Babylon to the English tale of Beowulf. Could it be that over millennia, people around the world have conjured up the same myth? A startling discovery in a forgotten cave has added a new character to the story. An extinct giant ape that's a dead ringer for Bigfoot. A possible answer to the riddle of Bigfoot lay hidden in a remote cave in China. Then in 1989, anthropologists found the teeth and fossilized bones of an ape-like creature far larger than man. The bones were mere fragments, but scientists estimated the animal stood more than eight feet tall and weighed as much as 1,200 pounds. They named it Gigantopithecus. This is a specimen of lower jaw of Gigantopithecus. This is the only adult male specimen. And it contains the teeth and the tooth-bearing part of the jaw. When you compare that with the human jaw, broken off at the same uh, parts, you can see it's obviously extraordinarily large. Some anthropologists believe we share a common ancestor with Gigantopithecus. Then, 11 million years ago, our lines split and we climbed different branches of our family tree. By 2 million years ago, Gigantopithecus roamed the land alongside Homo erectus, our upright ancestor. The proof lay in the cave in China. Along with the gigantobones, scientists found fragments of Homo erectus dating to the same time. If the two creatures coexisted two million years ago, could we still be living with Giganto's descendants? Grover Krantz likes to think so. The descriptions that people give of the uh, Bigfoot are the same size as what we have uh, reconstructed here on the uh, Gigantopithecus. It comes out to be about eight feet tall, hairy, wide-shouldered, a very heavy set, and with a nearly but uh, ape-like face, but somewhat uh, straighter, more vertical. And that's an exact description of the Bigfoot. According to his theory, Gigantopithecus originated in East Asia, where its bones were found. It could have crossed into North America over land bridges that formed during the Ice Ages. This was the same route taken by the first Americans, whose descendants still know the creature as Sasquatch. With nothing to go on but debatable sightings and questionable footprints, Bigfoot, by any name, remains the mere shadow of a ghost. Its bones have never been discovered. But Grover Krantz thinks he can explain that. 
He believes animals dying a natural death tend to hide themselves before they die. And until someone bags a Bigfoot, no bones will ever turn up. I have talked to so many hunters, game guides, uh, officials, and asked them all the same question. How many dead bears have you found that died a natural death? So far, my grand total is zero. Like Krantz, Joe Verhovery of British Columbia remains a true believer. His revelation came one Sunday in July 1988. He was camping along the Silver River, and he'd gone to pick some berries. Then I heard some noises, some kind of noises, there's somebody walking, so I thought, are there human here? And I said, anybody here? No one answered. Everything was quiet, except for the rustling of the leaves. Then Joe saw an animal like a bear, standing on its hind legs. But it didn't make the trampling noises a bear typically makes. And it didn't look like any bear he'd ever seen. I thought I'm getting a stroke. <laughs> So you see, seeing that one, uh, reach for a branch like this, and then I will put it down to the mouth and eat like this. Very politely, very civilized way. When I see this humongous creature, holy smoke, it's uh, over six feet tall. So I really get in kind of in uh, instant shock. Could not figure out what it is. It's not bear, it's standing straight up, and looks like a human in the bear coat. <laughs> <laughs> have a goosebumps. See, I never believed in such a thing, you know. Never in my life. Close to 3,000 people like Joe swear they've spotted the same hulking brown creature. Are they all seeing the same mirage? Or simply looking for their 15 minutes of fame? Those who search in earnest for Bigfoot pay a price for their belief. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I absolutely believe in Bigfoot. After I evaluate all the data and read all the information, and on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I think it's a lot of nonsense. And on Sundays, I rest. Bigfoot still lurks in the shadows, invisible and implausible. If he's just a figment of our imagination, his appeal is easy to see. A mysterious loner, jealously guarding his privacy, thumbing his nose at civilization. Coming up, has everyone gone pet crazy? Sure, they're man's best friends, but some animal lovers may be taking it a bit too far. Take a look on What a World, next from TLC. enjoying all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.